Hey everybody, how you doing? This is Steve Gill, back with you for another installment of Loving the Scriptures. Um, looking forward to getting into uh, the text that we have set in store. Um, as you may know, if you've been uh, following along with this podcast, uh, we are going through the book of Acts, and uh, we're coming upon one of my favorite passages here um, in the book of Acts, um, Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through um, 31. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. <clears throat> I'm not going to lie to you, though. I'm I kind of come to you just kind of to be open and vulnerable with 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 all of you. I, I'm kind of coming um, into this episode um, just as I as I'm talking, um, just kind of with a sad and and heavy heart. Um, it's just uh, just kind of difficult. Just something that's that's going on um, today. Um, and in fact, something um, even as I'm speaking right now um, that is just like ah oh, man. And um, just to share that with you, um, I guess the thing is, um, as I was looking out my window um, uh, earlier today, I saw snow falling from the sky. Ah, uh, I just thought, no, I'm not ready for this <laughs> yet. I'm not ready for snow. I'm not ready for cold. And it is cold outside. And... Um, just a little tidbit about me. I'm not a, I'm not a, a cold weather guy. Um, and this is, and you're talking to somebody who for the first 10 years of, of, of his life, uh, lived in upstate New York. Now here's the thing. <clears throat> uh, my attitude towards snow and cold, um, is different now than it was back then when I was a kid. I mean, I, I loved playing in the snow, um, as a kid. Um, I, but now that I'm grown up, um, and, uh, I have, I'm the one now who has to scrape the snow and the ice and stuff off of the, off of the car windshield. I'm the one who has to drive in the snow, um, when it's, when it's on the roads and things like that. Now, I, I don't want to exaggerate things too much, uh, cause I mean, it's not coming down like that outside right now. Um, it's, and, and in fact, there's nothing, uh, nothing that's coming down is, is probably going to accumulate. Um, but it's just a reminder that as the days are going by, we're getting closer and closer to that time where that sort of stuff is the norm. And I'm not, I'm not looking forward to it. Um, now if I had, if I'm not a winter kind of guy, I don't, I don't like winter, but if I can have cold weather without snow or not a lot of snow, um, I'll, I'll still be somewhat of a happy camper. Um, you know, if we have to have snow, um, it has to be in a decent amount. Um, I, you know, none of the, none of the heavy snow, um, heavy accumulation, no blizzards and, and, and things like that. Um, but, um, and it's interesting. I'm, you know, I've, I've surveyed some people that take the snow out of it. But even just the cold weather, and, and like it, right now, it's not super, super cold. It is, I mean, we, we, it is a lot cooler than what we've had in the past several weeks, which is, you know, just indicative of the change of seasons and things like that. Um, and just feeling that just gives you that, uh, gives me anyway, I can only speak to myself, that uneasy feeling of the reality um, that we're coming closer and closer to that time when, when weather is going to be um, extremely cold. Um, in the in a month or month and a half or two months ahead, where it's really going to be uh, the temperature is really going to be down there, and um, anyway, I, I, I've surveyed uh, people throughout my life from time to time. Just you know, if some a topic like this has come up, and I've asked them if you could have extremely if you if you had to choose between extremely hot weather and extremely cold weather. And there's nothing in between, um, and you had to choose between the two. What would you choose? And almost everybody, with the exception of one or two, would say that they would that they would choose the extremely cold weather. And that's totally opposite of where I am. Um, I, you know, and and the reasoning it, uh, that people choose that is pretty much uh, has been pretty much consistent because what they'll say um, is that you can you can layer yourself as with as many layers as you want in in hot weather you can't delayer your uh, can delayer yourself there's a limit to that um and so with cold weather at least you can put on layer upon layer upon layer 
which that, that is a somewhat of a good point. But the thing is, it's just a whole big production having to put all of that stuff on. Uh, so when you leave the house, you have to spend five minutes just laying on yourself. And then when you get to where you need to be or when you come back home, you have to delayer yourself for another five minutes. So it's just it's just a lot of it's just a lot of work. Um, so I'm I'm kind of the opposite of where most people seem to fall, at least just based on uh, what other people have told me when I've asked them the question. They seem to prefer the really cold weather over the really hot weather. Um, I would prefer the really hot weather as opposed to the really cold weather. And I'm talking about the two extremes. Both of those are uncomfortable. And especially in the hot days when you have humidity and and everything, um, it's, it's, man, it's something else. So um, I'm not saying that one is comfortable and the other is not. We're talking about two uncomfortable extremes. Which one would you prefer? I would be the one who say, give me the extremely hot weather um, over the extremely cold weather. I, I do not do the cold um, very well. So anyway, enough about cold, enough about snow. Let's uh, <laughs> let's get to our text um, where um, the apostles, Peter and John, have just gotten out of a very hot situation um, because they have been in front of the council. Um, now, remember um, where we are right now, because again, like I said, our, our, where we're looking at um, in our text is chapter 4, verses 23 through uh, through 31. This is uh, the the uh, prayer um, that the Christians pray after after Peter and John are released from prison and after they share with everybody um, what had taken place and what had happened. Um, and and like I said, this is one of my favorite uh, passages in the Book of Acts. And hopefully, maybe it'll be one of yours when, by the time we get done. Um, but. Remember, all of this st- uh, stems back from the beginning of chapter three. Remember the the uh, the uh, the miracle that stirred the pot. That's what we called it with the healing of the lame man, which served as a springboard, an open door for for Peter to to preach the gospel to the onlookers there in the temple who had seen this guy standing up, walking around, leaping up and leaping up and down and praising God. Now, of course, that catches the uh, the attention of the Sadducees, who don't, uh, who they aren't big fans um, of what Peter and John are teaching, um, and so they confront them, they arrest them, and they and they and they have uh, their interaction with him the next day. They didn't examine him that evening. Uh, they held held him in custody overnight, and they um, uh, and they examined them the next day. And so Peter pretty much has a discourse um, with them as well. I'll repeat this again. I know I've repeated this probably a couple times already, but I wanted I want to drill this through um, in that chapter in that, uh, chapter four verse eight. It says that it says that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, and with him being filled with the Holy Spirit, he went off and he said what he needed to say to remind you again that the Holy Spirit is very key in these in these in these encounters. And this isn't just a, 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 uh, something that happens with the apostles in the first century. The Holy Spirit who indwelled Peter back then is the whole, same Holy Spirit who indwells us. He can still work with us in power and speak through us with power and boldness. And so that's what <clears throat> that's that's what we see Peter doing. And so by the time he's done, um, you know, you have the the council, the 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 Sanhedrin. Um, they're saying well, we we don't know what to do with these guys. And here's the thing, because we to what we talked about, we what we spent some time talking about last time was the level of hard heartedness that these folks had um, towards Jesus and towards these apostles who were preaching the message about Jesus and about his resurrection from the dead. And so you know the you know the council here is 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 pretty much opposite of what um, the reception that you've kind of seen uh, from the people in the temple here in chapter four and even in and with those Jews um, at the, and, and on the day of Pentecost after after Peter preaches a sermon, um, they were people who saw the evidence before them and listened to what Peter had to say. And you would probably say that these are people who have come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ um, is alive and the, the, the evidence is just is irrefutable um, here with the council. The, the evidence is irrefutable. In fact, you, you, you see them admitting with their own mouths saying that we can't deny that, that a supernatural work has been done, that a sign has been performed. Uh, but we need to squash this down and we, and we need to tell these people no longer to speak 
uh, in the name of Jesus. And so you want a, you want a, a good example of hard-heartedness to the highest degree. Um, there you have it right there. Um, the evidence is right there before them um, that validates um, and confirms everything that Peter and John are saying. And yet these people who make up the council, most of them being Sadducees, um, they uh, they are ones who refuse uh, who refuse to uh, um, uh, to accept um, the situation and what Peter and John say, and so <clears throat> they you know when they call Peter and John back in, they they order them. They say you can no longer uh, speak anymore in the name of in the name of Jesus, and um, they say you know judge for yourself whether it's right for us to obey you um, rather than God. Um, which is just their indirect way of saying, look, we can't, uh, we're, we're going to do what we've been told to do. Um, and we can't help but but testify to what we've seen and heard. Um, that's what it ultimately came down to, um, which shouldn't be a surprise uh, because, you know, Peter and John have been saying, um, and primarily Peter, because he's the one who's kind of serves as a spokesman, um, is saying that uh, t- when talking about the resurrection of Christ, he says, we are witnesses of these things. So, you know, he's just saying, I'm just telling you just what I've seen and what I've heard. Um, now, of course, that doesn't that doesn't solve the problem. That doesn't that doesn't uh, I mean, just as far as how the, the council views these things. I mean, if we're talking about the level of hard heartedness that these people had, something like that isn't going to sway them or change their mind. And so they're they're adamant. Um, in saying that uh, that they that they are no longer to preach in the name of Jesus, and um, it even says, um, let me find the place here. Um, it says there with that they that they threaten them further. Um, yeah, verse twenty one of chapter four. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go. Listen to this: finding no way to punish them. Because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. Okay, so they're at a spot where they say we we don't know how to punish these these guys, and you know that's I think that's natural. How why how and why would you punish them? Now, of course, like I said last time, that's going to change as we go as we go down the line here because we're going to see uh, we're going to see them the apostles in front of the same council again in the very next chapter. And the punishment goes up a little bit because you see them getting beaten um, for for preaching in the name of Jesus, and you know they and they when they had specifically been told not to do so. Um, so that's where we that's where we left off last time. Now, so the apostles have been released, okay, and they go and and they reunite with their friends, and um, and then. Um, like I said, we get into the passage of scripture here that I think is is pretty amazing. So here's what I want to do. Oh, let me read the passage again. This is Acts chapter four, verses twenty three through thirty one. Okay, and let me read it to you, and then as always, we'll we'll uh, we'll dissect it here and see what we can come up with. Okay, so Acts chapter four, starting in verse twenty three, it says, "When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them." And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. And I guess the reason why um, I find this passage fascinating um, is number one. I mean, let's just look at this from a from a uh, overall perspective, and just this coming on the heels of what had just happened to the apostles. 
you know, one of the th- reasons why this is a this is amazing to me is because it demonstrates um, a true sense of faith, um, a degree of faith that I think that we lack in our culture today. The reason why I say that is because you have these you have these apostles who have just been released. They go to their to their Christian community and they explain everything that happened. What is the what is the thing that they decide to do when they hear about everything that happened? Do they sit around and complain and they say, "Man, this is that's just that's just a bunch of bull. Who do these people think they are?" and blah 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 blah. And you, and, you know, before you know it, you have a you have a circle of people who are just sitting around and all they do is just complain about about how things aren't working to their advantage as far as being able to preach the gospel without any uh, without any trouble, without any uh, persecution, without any harassment or whatnot. Um, no, they didn't do that. And, and that and I the description that I just made for you just said to you uh, that is that doesn't describe what the apostles did. I think that does describe what we do in large part today. Um, in fact, the, the, the term that I used last time, I think what I said is that we tend to whine a lot. Um, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate again. That's not to say that, um, that we should be people who enjoy persecution. I don't know of anybody who enjoys persecution. Um, if you know of anybody who enjoys persecution, let me know who that is, because I'd like to meet them. Um, <laughs> that's, that would be highly unusual. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, you know, we, we, it's it's not like we have to enjoy persecution. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but um, when's the last time in our culture, when you're if you're in a specific situation, or if you see culture at large uh, trying to squash down the things of God, or the mention of God in the public square, or um, where you see um, things where where people are trying to silence things having to do with God, when's the last time you knew of groups of Christians who said, given what we see around us and the trend and the direction that we see our culture going, we need to get together and we need to pray. I mean, is that something? I, I mean, I don't think that that I've, I'm hard pressed to think of one example of that um, where something like that goes on. Normally when it comes to any sort of, any sort of opposition um, on our end in the West, um, to whatever degree uh, that we experience here, um, we we resort to complaining, and um, and you know, and depending on who who you talk to or or who you listen to, because sometimes I hear this uh, things like this over the airwaves on Christian radio. Not knocking Christian radio; Christian radio is good. I listen to it a lot. Um, but in some in some areas, you have people who, um, as they sit in their micro uh, in front of their microphones, they complain about about um, you know the 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 way of our culture and how they're trying to squash down Christianity and things like that. And um, um, it, it's okay. I think it, let me say this: it's okay to talk about those things sometimes too, and express how we don't like what we see. But it's something else when that's all we do, okay? Um, and so that that's you know it it almost has a has a feel of powerlessness to it. I mean, if that's all we do, it's almost as if we do that because we feel like that's the only thing that we can do, and that and that we're powerless to do anything about it. Um, and and we're powerless when it comes to um, trying to advance the gospel even in the in the face of opposition. And sometimes we might think that we need to regain our footing and and fight for our rights to be able to preach the gospel. And then once that's secured, then we can go back and do what we've been doing before preaching the gospel. If we preach the gospel, that's a big if, because the question would be, do we even do that um, on a consistent basis? Um, but when you look at when you look at the apostles here, uh, when 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 the when the when not, when the Christian community hears what happened to them, you don't see them sitting around in a circle among their groups and just grumbling and complaining. Um, they the the first thing that they do is they lift their the lift their voices up in prayer. So, yeah, so you see that in verse 23 when it says, When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And remember what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Their, their, their orders were clear. You are no longer allowed to teach in the name of Jesus anymore. 
You cannot. Now, of course, that flies in the face with what the apostles have been ordered by Jesus Christ himself to do. And you get the sense as much, just as we saw last time, that they have zero intention of following through with that order. So they understand what the situation is. They understand that they have to be obedient to God rather than to the council that they just got released from. So they're going to continue to do what Christ had told them to do. And they know, they understand that that's going to invite more trouble. And sure enough, what we're going to see when we get into chapter five is that they get into trouble again with the council uh, because they they directly disobeyed um, what, they, what they told them to do and, and not preaching in the name of, of, of Jesus. Okay. So they understand and they recognize that the very thing that they need to do is, is to pray. So that's what you see in verse 24. It says, and when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, and then they go into, um, they go into their, uh, go into their, their prayer. Um, there and I, I just want to I just want to point out real quick just the whole thing of the the, the communal feel um, of this because it says they lifted their voices together um, and again it, this is something where I think that there's a lot there's there's something to be said um, definitely something positive uh, to be said about communal prayer especially in times when the church is feeling the pressure from culture around them. Um, whether it's just uh, regular culture at large, whether it's um, um, opposition from government officials or, or whatever the case may be, getting together and being gathered together as a body of believers with a common cause and a common purpose um, is, um, uh, is something that's truly amazing. Now, one of the other things that I think is amazing about this um, is, the, is, that, um, is that they – their their concern what you get from this from this passage is that their concern is for the spread of the gospel to uh, uh, the spread of the gospel to continue when you really read through this whole thing you understand where their heart is okay you understand that their their main number one concern is for the gospel to spread and for and for uh, and for God's power to be shown and displayed in their midst now I ask you, how often do we here in 21st century America have that as a burning desire in our heart, whether whether in, in times good or in times bad, where we come together as a church and we have that burning desire as a group and we pray together to that end? Think about that. Now, like I said, and I've and I've talked about this before in in previous episodes, and I'll just mention it briefly because we don't need to we don't need to 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 beat a dead horse here. Um, but um, usually, uh, when it comes to corporate prayer, it's very brief, um, and we don't spend a lot of time praying together. Um, and usually, when we do pray together in those brief amount of times, um, it's usually over things that are situational in our own lives. Um, you know, having to do with, you know, we want, we want God to intervene as it relates to trouble and in the workplace. I'm having trouble with a relationship with a coworker or, um, I need to find a job, pray that God would open doors and things like that. Now, let me re reiterate this too, is that I'm not saying that those things are bad. Okay, and I'm not, and I'm not bringing that up to say we shouldn't do those things anymore. I'm just saying is, I'm just saying is that what we seem to major on when it comes to prayer, as 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 small of attention that we that we give to it as as a corporate body of believers, uh, seems to focus on the secondary things as opposed to the primary things. I would love, you know, I was. Um, it was several months ago now. Uh, it's been less than a year ago, I, I would say, but it was it was some months ago um, where I was together with a small group at our church on a, on a Sunday evening, um, where we got together uh, to pray. That was that was the focus of that time that we got together for about an hour, and the prayer, the time that we spent praying, was specifically praying for our community praying for our nation, praying for our world, and praying to God that he would open up opportunities and saying and, and asking God, okay, God, what's our part? What part do we play in, in, in all of this? How can we be used of you to reach out to people who don't know you? And let me tell you, that was a wonderful, that was a wonderful hour of prayer. Um, that was, that was something else. Um, and so I, I, 
I don't think I think I don't think that there's enough of that. And so when you when you get to when you get to this passage here in Acts 4, you get the sense that's that's what they want to see. They want to see the spread of the gospel continue. And the occasion for their prayer is that since that's their desire in their heart, they now see that a barrier has cropped up in their way. And now, and like I said, they we shouldn't look at the, we shouldn't look at this as if to think that they that they are trying to wonder whether they should follow through with what the council says or not. No, their mind is already made up. So the, the, I think the other thing that, that, that brings about this occasion of prayer is, is them knowing that they know that they are not going to follow through with what the council says. And so they know that in continuing to do what they've been told to do by Christ, they are going to invite more opposition. And so Pretty much what they're saying is don't let those barriers that we know are going to crop up in the future stand in the way of, of people seeing your power at work and letting and letting your word spread and you using us in boldness to preach the gospel, to preach the word, to preach the message. And I just think that's amazing. So we get a glimpse of the heart uh, of these of these men um, as they come together to pray. Okay, um, so that's why this 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 uh, this whole thing is amazing, and um, you know you get the sense. Well, let me, let me do this. Let's let's just continue to go through here, and I'll and I'll point things out as as we go. Um, so what we've already looked at, we 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 see the apostles. They get together with their friends. They they report what has happened, and so now they are um, they are. Uh, um, they're talking. They, they, as soon as they understand everything that's gone on, they lift their voices together in prayer. And what do they say? Well, let's start out. We're in the middle of verse 24, where it says, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Now stop right there. That, that just sounds... It just, all that really does, it sounds like it's just a routine opening for a prayer. And it's easy just to breeze by that, just to breeze over that. As if there's really nothing significant in there. Notice how they address God. Notice how they address him. They call him Sovereign Lord. They understand that everything, that God is sovereign over everything. Even sovereign over those times when the apostles are in the face of trouble and danger. So they understand that everything that goes on Everything that has gone on, everything that is going on right now, and everything that will go on from that point forward when they after they pray, everything is going to be the in the hands of their sovereign Lord. Now, the fact that we serve a God who's sovereign should give us tremendous, tremendous comfort. So when when the apostles see themselves in their situation that they do in chapter five a little bit later, um, I would imagine that something like that, even though they're in a not in a non-ideal situation, a non-ideal circumstance, they understand that God is sovereign. And just think about that. When it, put yourself in their sandals, if you're standing there in the council again, and they're saying, "We told you specifically not to preach in the uh, in the in this in the name of of Jesus. We told you not to do that." And they and they beat you uh, at the end of the day because of what you did. We can we walk away we can walk away from that understanding. Wow, th- that whole thing isn't ideal. I would rather walk away with some of my flesh intact than to be beaten like I just got beaten. But you know what? God is sovereign. God is in control. God is orchestrating and working everything to His own ends and for His own glory. As long as we know that, as long as we understand that, really, there we don't have a whole lot to fear. Okay, if God is in control, see, see, because because these 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 moments of trouble that happen and that unfold, these aren't situations where God where where these things happen because God fell asleep. Um, and so by the time He wakes up, He's like, "Oops, I let things get out of control." And um, and now I now my people are in trouble. No, that's not how that's not the way it works. And and like I said, even though the 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 situation with Peter and John earlier in this chapter is not ideal, what do we see in that? We see there an opportunity for Peter because we saw it last time 
um, uh, we saw Peter with an opportunity to preach truth, to preach the word to these hostile men, this count, the council. So it's just amazing that even in the t in, even in the negative times, they they took advantage of a of a of an opportunity where they were able to preach the gospel. And so I think that 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 speaks as much to the sovereignty of God, where even through negative circumstances, they had a chance to uh, to to preach and give testimony to the word of God. And you'll 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 see Peter, uh, excuse me, not Peter, but Paul doing the same thing later on in the book of Acts. Um, so um, it's just interesting that they that it, when they start out and they identify who they're praying to, they say they say Sovereign Lord. Now they say Sovereign Lord. Listen, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them? Now we might ask, what in the world is why are the why in the world are they bringing that up? Well, I think that they that they bring that up and they and they identify that classification of God um, because they acknowledge that's their way of openly acknowledging that He is powerful in all things. Listen. When we pray to God, we're praying to a powerful God. And that's, I, I feel like even when I say that, it, 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 it has a, a, a sense of understatement to it, where we say that we're, we're praying to a powerful God. Now, you know, God's power uh, can be displayed and manifested in, any, in many ways. But one of those ways that we know of, now, of course, we weren't there when this happened, but one of the greatest ways, I'm sure, where God's power is a display in that work is when he created the world. And when he created the universe and listen, since he is the creator and the originator of all things, along with the fact that he is a sovereign God, um, that really, that really gives us more comfort in the sense that if God is, is sovereign and he's able to create the world as he, as he did, um, then that should give us comfort in the sense that we, we yield ourselves to his power and to his protection. Okay. Now I want to sh I want to share a, a, a passage with you that kind of that kind of works along these lines. It's in the book of Isaiah. Um, I'm reading from Isaiah chapter 51. I'm going to read a few verses here that kind of that kind of goes along this um, a, a, along this understanding here. Okay. So um, in Isaiah chapter 51, and I'm reading. I'm starting in verse 12 um, here, and this is um, and this is God. This, this is God. Uh, speaking through through Isaiah, so this is these are the words of God um, in Isaiah um, chapter fifty one verse twelve, where he says, "I, I am He who comforts you. Who are who are you? Who are you that you are afraid of man who dies, and the son of man uh, who and the son of man who is made like grass?" So you know, in other words, he's saying like, "Look, who, why are you afraid of man? Uh, you know, instead of clinging to me." The all-powerful, eternal God, you put your, 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 your fear man who is mortal. He dies and he's like grass. You know, in other words, the grass doesn't last, doesn't last for very long. So he says, who are you that you are afraid of man who dies, of the son of man who is like grass, and have forgotten the Lord your maker? Now, it, you know, that think about that first thing, who has forgotten the Lord your maker. You know, sometimes we can we can get to a point where if we have people who are opposed to us because of who we are in Christ and the stand that we make in Christ, we sometimes we can tend to focus more on our enemies than we do that the person for the person who works on our behalf, who is God Almighty himself. And so we we focus so much attention on who is against us and how they come against us. You know, isn't that really putting our, when we put our thought and our focus and our emphasis on the people who are mortal at the exclusion of the God who is immortal and eternal and powerful, much more powerful? Do you, do you see the, how that how that kind of doesn't make sense? And that's kind of what, that's, that's kind of what God is, is getting at here in Isaiah. He says, you put your focus on and, and your fear on, on men who die and who are like the grass, and you have forgotten the Lord, your maker, right? And, and verse 13, that's not the end of verse 13 there in that passage. Verse 13 goes on to say, and this is a description of the Lord, your maker, who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. And you fear continually all the day because of the wrath of the oppressor who uh, who he set who he sets himself to destroy. And where is the wrath of the oppressor? He who is bowed down shall speedily be released. He shall not die 
and go down to the pit, neither shall his bread be lacking. I am the Lord your God, who stirs up, and listen, here's here's again where you see a bits of, of what he does with creation, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. So in other words, he's saying, because of who you serve, you have no need to fear. Even even if they even if you are dealing with people who lay their hands on you, and 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 things along those lines, because who are we dealing with? Who is who is who is on our side? The person who's on our side is the God who, as verse thirteen says, stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations uh, laid the foundations of the earth, right? And so, you know, when we acknowledge that that we are dealing with the God of creation who displays His power in such a way where we know that His power is manifested in the fact that when that in the beginning He just spoke and it came to be. And that's the God that's on our side. Should should that not give us a great degree of comfort? I hope it does. And so I think the apostles acknowledged that they understood that. So they're not just saying words willy nilly to sound to sound sp- ultra spiritual. I, I think that the, that those thoughts in their minds is going along the same line. So the, so they say, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. So you're powerful to make them, and you and you have control over all of those things. Why? Because he created it. Listen, we don't serve a God who created the universe and created the world, and now everything is is you know as we see them now is outside of his control. We're not we're not looking at this from a deistic uh, point of view where he created things and then just stepped back and watched things and is watching things happen. The fact the the, impl- the further implication that we see here is that since God created things, he's also in control of it. Uh, you know, that kind of goes along with what the writer of Hebrews says, where he holds everything together by the word of his power. Right. So um, so the, the so the Christians here and I keep saying the apostles uh, think that and certainly they do. But again, I, this I have to be careful because this isn't isn't just the apostles who are praying these things. It's that when it, it's everybody, the, the, the friends that they got in contact with when this whole thing of persecution was over and they and they and they talk about talk with the rest of the Christian community. So they're all praying this. So think about that, that you you're dealing with people probably even outside of the apostolic circle who get it. They get it. And I think that's that's so amazing. And they're expressing as much to the God, to God, as they're as they're praying to as they're praying to Him. Now they continue in verse twenty-five. It says, "Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit." And there again is an acknowledgement by them because they're about to quote from Scripture here. They're they're about to quote um, um, from Psalm, right? So um, and and specifically Psalm two, the first couple of verses of Psalm two. So here they they recognize they understand that scripture has, has it was inspired by the holy spirit through the mouth of david they understand this um and so they they quote from psalm 2 where they say why did the gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain and the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the lord and against his anointed now a couple of things um first of all um it's important to understand that they acknowledge that um, that scripture itself said that trouble and opposition um, was was to be a reality in their lives, and this is this is something that is spoken way back in the days of David, because because David is the one who wrote this psalm, and it's even looking forward to things where where it says, notice that it says, and I think in the actual text in Psalm it says, why did the actually let me check that out, because it might say nations. Um, in Psalm 2, in the actual passage that this comes from in Psalm 2. Yes, in Psalm t- uh, 2 verse 1 says, why do the nations rage? Um, now, they're not, just because it says Gentiles here in Acts, it does, it, you know, it, it's pretty much the same thing. In fact, um, in the Greek, normally the term for Gentiles and nations are the same thing. Sometimes it's translated as pagan. And really the idea is um, most of the time that the word is ethne, by the way, um, in the Greek. And and most of the time it, it, it has this idea of, of groups of people that are, that are non-Jewish. Um, and so... What you have here, and and here um, in Acts, 
at least in my ESV. I don't know if there's other translations where the quote that it's shown up here in Acts says nations as well. I don't know. Um, it, it, they're interchangeable, though. I'm not saying one is better than the other or one is right and one is wrong. Like I said, they, they both have the same meaning to it. Um, but it's interesting that it says, why did the Gentiles rage? Now, who were, who were the people that had been opposing Peter and John in the previous section here in Acts 4? Were they Jews or were they Gentiles? They were Jews, were they not? So here again, we're going to touch a little bit on, on what we've talked about before um, as far as the people of God and who aren't the people of God and, and that sort of thing because we think of the Jewish people, the people who thought the Jewish people are the people, you know, just based on their Jewishness, are the people of God, God's special people. Um, whereas when we look here and, and they quote from Psalm 2, or say, why do the Gentiles rage? And in other words, they're they're quoting these things back to God, saying, We understand and we know that this is that this is a reality because your word says as much. But it's interesting that they that they draw from this passage where it says, Where did why did the Gentiles rage? Um, just kind of as a response of saying that we that what has happened before is is nothing that surprises us. But what happened before to the apostles came at the hands of the Jews. So what is that saying in an indirect way? In an indirect way, because I don't think that this is they're they're majoring on this whole thing of who's ethnicity is who or whatever. But but what is this what does this indicate? That indicates that these unbelieving Jews are in the same boat as unbelieving Gentiles. That says a lot. So would we dis, even though these these people were made up the of the council are ethnic Jews? Would we say that they are the people of God? They're God's special people. We've asked this question before, but I think the answer is clear. No, that they are not. As we as we talked about, and we don't have to go into great detail about it, we went at length about it uh, in the last couple of weeks um, or last few weeks, not so much last time, but the times before then, um, that the common denominator of, of what, it, uh, what it takes for people to be considered the people of God is faith. So that means believing Jews and believing Gentiles are the people of God. Now, the fact that, that, these, that they're quoting from Psalm 2, talking about the nations or the Gentiles, why do they rage? And not only that, it says, why did the nations rage and the, pe- and the peoples plot in vain? Now listen, the kings of the earth you know, so we're talking about a widespread thing here, where in that context in Psalms is talking about people outside of the outside of the nation of Israel. But here, the 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 Christians understand that what happened at the hands of the of the unbelieving Jews is in line with and in step with what Scripture says, even though that Scripture says that that, that has something to do with the Gentile world. So even there, you you have an indirect, and I say indirect because I don't think that this is the main thing that they're trying to say. It's just an observation that I think is very key. That they that that these Jews are being lumped in um, as being of the same category as people who are outside of the people of God. You understand what I'm saying? So I just bring that up because I think again that serves as a, um, a to reinforce the fact of, of of things that we've that we've talked about before. Okay. But notice what it says here, you know, the why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? It says the kings of the earth set themselves. In other words, they say they 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 set themselves up um in in a in a in a position of rebellion. And the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Okay? So so against the Lord, um you know, who, who they understand would be God the Father and his anointed. Now who's the anointed? The anointed is Jesus Christ. Now, notice here, it says that the kings of the earth and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord's people. No, I mean, that's not what it says there. They they stand up against the Lord and against his anointed. They, their number one primary target is against God. So, so think about this. Uh, what we see going on with with levels of persecution are people who are coming again directly against the Lord, the, the God, and against the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. The only thing is, none of those people are there physically in their midst. So who's who's the target of their of their hatred? The people who follow Him, the people who follow God, which in this case were were Peter and John, and other Christians, as we as we're going to see uh, later on as as the Book of Acts unfolds. Right. So um, so make no mistake, make no mistake. 
um, and and let this be implanted in your minds is that when whenever you're 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 opposed because of who you are in Christ, that is a display. That is an expression of people who are lashing out against God Himself, and you're just the closest target because Jesus Christ is not there physically and bodily there where they would go after Him, but you follow Him and and He does live in you through His Holy Spirit. By the way. So you are the closest target by which they that they're able to that they are able to have the ability to go up against the Lord and to speak against the Lord, okay? But make no mistake, they are it is a it's a it is a hostility towards God Himself. Remember, and those and this is something that we're going to see much later because it's in chapter nine. But um, uh, when when Saul has his encounter with the risen Lord on the Damascus Road, remember what Jesus said to him. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, is Jesus walking around bodily and physically during that time? No, he's up in heaven. His, his, his persecution is aimed against his people, God's people, Christians. And yet, Jesus says, why do you persecute me? So, it, it, the, 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 the persecution that is expressed against, uh, against God's followers, followers of Christ, is um, in a very real way an expression of hostility towards God Himself. Okay, so and and also I, I should say one other thing in drawing from this is that uh, we understand is that you know when, as as these believers and they're praying and they're and they're and they're rehearsing back to God this their their understanding of Scripture and saying that this is what Scripture says. We also understand that that this level of persecution isn't something that caught them by surprise. And you know what? That's that's something that we find ourselves in all too often. Whenever persecution comes our way, we kind of scratch our heads. Like, Why is this happening? This came out of nowhere. Listen, what did Peter say in his epistle? Don't be surprised when these painful trials are, are coming upon you as though something strange were happening to you. First Peter 4, right? Um, and 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 the, the trials don't don't understand that to mean just the regular trials of life. The context of, of what Peter is saying in that passage and even in the entire book, um, the, the trials that he's talking about is persecution, okay? So Peter himself, later on, when he pens that epistle, says to his audience, don't be surprised at the painful trial that you're suffering as though something strange were happening to you. He says, you should expect this. You know, we look at we can look at at, at different passages. We don't have, we don't have to do that now. You know, just for the sake of time. Um, but even but even with even with it, come to think of it, um, what P, what Jesus said to the apostles in the upper room discourse, because he even said to them, "There's going to be a time where where people think that they're doing a service to God when they put you to death." Now, who where, who is one of those people that's going to be a direct uh, uh, fulfillment of that? It's going to be James, right? We're going to see that much later and when it comes to chapter 12. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of you are familiar with Scripture, right? but maybe that's a bad assumption. Maybe some of you are coming into this with, without really a, a great knowledge of Scripture, and that's okay. This is a great place for you to learn. If, that, if that's the case for you, then I guess that just served as a spoiler alert. Spoiler alert is, is that one of the apostles gets killed. Um, James, the brother of John, he gets put to the sword, right? Um, so, you know, th this is something that they've been warned about. Now, again, this is, when we look at this passage here in chapter four, again, we're talking about a prayer of people that are even outside of that apostolic circle, I believe. Okay. So even they get it though, and they understand that, that what scripture says, it indicates that things like this trouble that, that Peter and John experienced, it's just a fulfillment of what scripture has said all along would happen. And it's an, and what it says is that it's 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 an expression of, of of hostility towards the Lord and against His anointed. So it's very interesting and it's very noteworthy that these are people who understood. They they knew the score. They understood. They 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 knew what the dealio was. Okay, and that's and that's very, that's that's pretty significant. When you know what the what the what the real deal is, um, you're in a better position to forge through ahead with what God has for you to do. If you're caught by surprise. And you don't know the things that you're supposed to know uh, because scripture warns about these things, your reaction is going to be a little bit different. So take this home in your own hearts um, as you read this as well. We do not live in an opposition free world. I was reading something, I was reading a, a manuscript for somebody a, a while back, 
and they wanted me to read some things that they had written, give them uh, their uh, their opinion on some of the things. And one of the things that they were saying uh, that they were talking about persecution. And he was saying, and he said that persecution in no way, shape, or form. I am just paraphrasing here. This isn't an exact quote. He said persecution in no way, shape, or form should exist in the United States. I'm sorry, I, I have to disagree with that. Now, persecution looks different here than it does in other places of the world, but I don't see anything in Scripture where it says that certain geographical areas, just based on their how their government is set up and things like that, should be exempt from persecution. Listen, if you name the name of Christ and you stand up for truth, trust me, it, it, it's not going to be long before before you get opposition for that. I mean, there's just no way that you can escape it. So there's there's no such thing as this as as this notion where persecution should not exist in places like the United States. I hate to break it to you, but that thought is unbiblical. Um, there's there's no exit clause for for countries like ours or other places in the West where persecution shouldn't happen. And in fact, I'm one who would tend to think that um, there's a great possibility that the level of persecution in our world, in our in our country, may increase to very uncomfortable levels um, in the future. Will that happen in our lifetime? I don't know. I don't exclude the possibility that it would, um, but I certainly think that it's a possibility. And so we need to be, at the very least, have the awareness of the fact that Scripture talks about things like this, and it warns us about these things. So when they do crop up, we're not surprised by it and saying, where, where did this come from? Okay, and so that's where these Christians here in this in this passage were. They understood from Scripture that this was something that they should expect. Now, verse twenty-seven says, "For truly in this city there were gathered together against the against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed." Um, so it, there again, they're making the connection: Jesus, whom you anointed. They're making the connection to what they quoted from Psalm when they said they stand against the Lord and against His anointed. Who is that anointed? Is Jesus. Um, it says, for truly in this city, Jerusalem, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. Now here, I think I, I mentioned several weeks ago, um, earlier on in our study in Acts, um, where you know we're, we're talking about who's responsible for, for the murder of Jesus. Um, we've seen here from the mouth of Peter that that he that he that he says he points to the Jews and says that you put this man to death, and that's of course is because he's speaking directly to the Jews, and they were complicit in this whole thing, right? They were screaming for his blood, crucify him, crucify him, right? That doesn't mean though that they were the only people involved in this. It was the Romans and the Gentiles who ran the spikes through Jesus' hands and his feet, right? And it was the soldiers. Listen, it was those Roman soldiers who were mocking him um, with the crown of thorns and, and everything like that. Um, so they were a part of this, too. So um, who is guilty in this whole thing of what happened to Jesus? Was it the Jews or the Gentiles? Answer, both. Both of them. OK. And he calls out uh, specifically Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with, and he just uses a general, generally, Gentiles. And of course, that's significant because what is that, what does that passage say that they quoted from? Why do the Gentiles rage, right? So, so along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. So you, again, this is, they lump these two people together and saying you are in the same boat in the sense that you, that, that those people were going, coming against the anointed one, against Jesus, okay? Verse twenty-eight. Now listen. To do whatever your hand and your plan, whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Okay. So this wasn't some sort of unforeseen accident. This wasn't something where God said, "I didn't see this coming." This was all according to according to the plan and foreknowledge of God. We, Peter says as much way back in his Pentecost sermon in in uh, in chapter two. Right. Remember that. Um, so. So these people acted wickedly. Now, here's a situation where people in their wickedness and through their wickedness are fulfilling the plans of God. Now, our minds have trouble wrapping our wrapping our arms around uh, around that. Um, but make make no mistake. And this should give us a little bit of, a, of comfort as well, that um, that even even when it comes to certain acts of evil, um God is still in control. And I know that that, that sounds weird. Um, and that's something that even with me, I have a hard time just kind of putting my finger on that. Um, you know, but um, 
you know, there's there you can go down all sorts of paths of discussion as far as what that looks like, or you know, even with you know, let me say this: we're not saying that God is is uh, the perpetrator of evil. I think the best way to look at this is to say that that God allows the evil as already in the human heart to to be used to to ultimately come to um, come to fruition to accomplish his purposes in the end which God's purposes are always good so you can look at it from the perspective of Joseph um, in uh, Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 where he said to your said to his brothers about him men being uh, so selling him to, e- uh, to Egypt you meant it for evil but uh, you but God meant it for good right that's just kind of another way of, of, of looking at it but this is all this was all uh what the what these people did uh was according to um what, what is, they did whatever uh verse 28 your hand and your plan had predestined to take place and that and by the way that doesn't excuse or absolve them from the wickedness that they that they committed okay um, it was a part of God's plan, but they are still guilty because, again, what what's what is truly being exercised? Here's what you have to understand: God is not making these people do evil things. There is evil, wicked evil that is already re- residing in people's hearts, and people are just exercising that. And God is allowing the, them to use that that wickedness for the for the good purposes of His sacrifice that would bring salvation to uh, to many people. Okay. Verse 28, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, verse 29. And now, and actually, let me back up because I, I think this whole thing of, of this being according to the predestined plan of God is, is pretty important because that's that's something that we can take comfort, comfort in too. Because again, like I said, what happened with Jesus wasn't a whoops. And I think by extension, what we can grab, what we can, what we can untangle from this um, is that, um, is that with what happened with Peter and John wasn't a whoops either. Um, and, you know, I mentioned that a little bit before. But again, this goes back to the whole idea of we're dealing with the sovereign Lord. Sovereign Lord, they, they addressed him um, in verse 24. Okay, so all things are in his hands. You can think about what, what Jesus said to his disciples way back in uh, Matthew chapter 10, um, where um, um, he said, where are not two sparrows sold for a penny, but yet not one of them falls to a gr- falls to the ground apart from the will of my Father. I mean, you, you kind of it, it kind of runs along those same lines. If if God has it, you know has everything in control as it relates to cheap birds, um, then He has you in His hand as well. Even in times when things when things aren't working the way that they need to, or when persecution raises its ugly head. Okay, now verse 29, they say, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants uh, to continue to speak your word with boldness. I think uh, something can be said there about, you know, the the fact that they asked for boldness um, to be able to continue to do this. Um, that that seems to indicate that you, given what has happened and given what they know is the potential of happening in the future, they understand that they're that they're that they're in a position where they might start to become fearful of preaching the message like they've been told to do, and so they come before the Lord and they say, "Look, I want you to, Lord, we ask that you consider their their threats. Here, in other words, hear what they have said, and hear what they have threatened, and um." Um, and um, and grant, as it says, grant to your servants to continue to to continue to speak your word with boldness. So they're asking for boldness. It's kind of along the same lines of what P, uh, what Paul asked the Ephesians uh, to pray for in, in Ephesians chapter six, that he would be able to proclaim the gospel boldly as he ought to speak. Right. Um, verse thirty. While you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. Now, that has been that has been one of the things that caused the problem to, uh, that that caused the problem in the first place. Remember the, the 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 healing of the lame man, and that was a sign that stirred the pot. And um and even the the uh, the uh, when they when the, the 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 council approached Peter and John in their examination of them, they say, "By what name or by what authority?" In other words. Um, did you do this thing, you know? And so um, they recognize this, as we saw last time, um, as a um, as a sign um, that uh, that they couldn't deny. Is that that a notable sign has has taken place? We can't deny that, but we have to squash this thing down, and we have to tell these people not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus. So 
what is their response? Lord, work more signs. You know, you know, it, you know, they, they, they have a problem with the sign, but don't stop with the signs. Don't stop with the sign. So while you give us boldness to speak, they're saying in verse 30, uh, do the, do this while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through your, through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Now we, well, we will see that. We will see that in, in, in near, uh, in near passages to come. Okay. Um, you know, so they, so you'll see, we'll see that later um, in the book of Acts. So that, that's going to be a direct answer to prayer. Um, now, verse 31, the last verse of our section here says, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to, and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Okay. So, there it is. So verse 31, you can, you can sum up verse 31, uh, pretty much by saying, by, by, uh, by saying that God, God answered them in that time through the, through the shaking of the, of the, of the ground. And it was his way of saying, I'm with you. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. And, um, what, a, what a sense of, of, of reassurance that must have been for them at that particular moment. And as they prayed that the the you know the place where they were um, was uh, was shaken, and they were all filled with uh, um, filled with the Holy Spirit, and so they they would go out and they would continue to to preach. As it says there, they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Okay, and you know what? That's something that you and I can pray for as well, because I think uh, you know a lot of times we we don't see ourselves as bold people. Um, and because we don't see ourselves as bold people, we don't see ourselves as people who would be able to, to preach the gospel to people. Um, and, but listen, these were, these were ordinary people who prayed to God for boldness in that. And God honored that. Do you think that God can do the same thing for us today? Absolutely. Absolutely. He can. And so it's just, it's just, it's just wonderful to see how God honors their request um, you know, it, and then, like I said, they, where they were gathered was shaken. It was almost, almost as if they said, he said, I hear you and I'm with you 100% and I'm going to see you through, um, in this whole thing. And so what, is, what happens? They continue to speak the word of God boldly. And they, and again, like it says, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. There he is again. Um, and we've seen him before and it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that all of these things are able to happen. Now we're going to see a lot more wonderful things as we go through, um, in the book of Acts. But we're going to end it there. Um, that's the that's the that's the section that I've been looking forward to to speaking on and and uh, just kind of uh, going over with all of you. And um, that's uh, I'm glad. I hope that 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 you were really able to capture the wonder of what was going on in that place where they were where they were praying this prayer. Um, and um, the same sort of prayer can be can be prayed today. Um, especially and particularly as it relates to boldness, uh, to be able to go out and, and speak boldly. Now, that doesn't necessarily have to be directly a- applicable to any sort of public preaching of the gospel, you know, street preach or anything like that. Although if you wanted to do that, you can. Boldness can come in any form, but even if you're just talking one-on-one um, with an unsaved uh, next door neighbor or something like that. Um, you know, the because it, it, even with people that you know, Preaching the gospel may be a tad bit intimidating, and you can just pray to God. God, give me the boldness to be able to speak the word as you would have me to speak it, and the truth that would penetrate a sinful heart, so that they can be drawn to you and and find you in a saving way. Um, you know, so um, let's not discount ourselves because we think, well, I'm not a bold person. Well, great, join the club. Uh, you know, join the join the first century club because that probably described a lot of people um, in the first century and then in the initial workings of the first century early church. Um, so don't don't dismiss that. That's something. That's a prayer that you can pray to the Lord as well. And um, and I think that and when we don't do that, I think we we miss out on allowing uh, ourselves to see God do amazing things in and through us. Um, I think I told you last time that I've you know, I've talked to people before where they are able to attest to the power of the Holy Spirit working through them as they're as they're preaching the gospel or, or at least speaking spiritual things to people um, who don't know Christ. Um, 
And, you know, you, I think that when you, you leave those times, when those when those times are said and done and you maybe go to bed at night or something or as you're as you're sitting and meditating or something on, on what God has done, you, you, you stand amazed um, at the power of God um, that just displayed itself in your life. Little old you or, and little old me, because um, we're we are in ourselves, in our humanity, very weak people. But man, when we're able to behold what God is able to do through us, it's something else. Right. Okay, so like I said, we'll leave it there. Um, and um, our next, uh, I, I think I decided what I'm going to do because I, t- I, I, t- I told you that I didn't know if I was just going to take the rest of the chapter um, as one episode and then start chapter five in another episode or if I was going to take all of those together. Um, even though I know either way that, that chapter four, verse 32 um, through 37 is very much attached to the first 11 verses of chapter five. And I think I want to keep it that way. So I think what I'm going to do, what we're going to do next time when we get into Acts is we're going to go or we're going to try to go from chapter four, verse 32 through chapter five, verse 11, because they do go together. They are attached together, which means what we're going to be looking at um, is the whole thing of Ananias and Sapphira. And I know that that is something that account is something that is um, um, that, that, that kind of leaves some question marks in people's minds because, um, you know, you're talking about people who, after they were rebuked, just there on the spot, fall over dead. Um, and the question is, is raised in people's mind. Well, isn't that a tad bit too harsh? And so we'll, we'll talk about some of those things. We'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about, we'll, we'll look at the, 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 uh, the actual occasion and then we'll discuss, you know, what, what, how are we to, to take this? Um, because a lot of us, again, might think that that's a tad bit too harsh, but is it, is it? Um, now, of course, we know if God's behind it, we know that God did nothing wrong. So we know that everything that we say here is correct and 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 what happened here should have should have happened. Um, but again, like I said, we're, we're going to wrestle with some questions here because, you know, that this is something that people wrestle with. And so they ask themselves, how do how are we to look at this? OK, and so we'll talk about that. But that's not going to be next time. Um that's obviously going to be the next time we get into acts but next time what i want to do i'm going to take i'm going to we're going to take a break and i'm going to do something here that i'm actually going to be i'm i'm actually going to look forward to um next next time what we're going to do we're going to talk about a particular person in the bible um a a character in the bible um who um when you when you read books about him well there's hardly any books about him but when he comes up um, in other books because he, he his life intersects with more um, known characters in the Bible. Um, he gets a lot of negative press from the Christian world, whether it's in books, whether it's in sermons, whether it's in commentaries. Um, he is he is maybe one of the most um, unpopular um, unpopular characters of in the Bible just as just as it relates to how people view him and what they say about him in 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 their teachings again in sermons and commentaries and things like that but I am going to next time fly in to this to this to this man's defense because I because I'm going to be I'm going to make the case that uh, pretty much most, if not all, of the charges that are brought against this character of the Bible um, is unnecessary and wildly, wildly unfair. And really, when when you when I do a study on this person, I'm hard pressed to find any book or commentary that says something positive about this guy. So I literally feel like I'm in a world by myself uh, when it comes to me coming to this person's defense. And in coming to this person's defense, we're going to see what we can actually learn from him. Okay. Now, who is this person that that I'm talking about? Well, you're just going to have to tune in next time to find out who I'm talking about. But it's it, it it's kind of going to have a feel of I, I feel like in coming into this I'm going to I'm going to serve as this as this person's defense attorney so I feel like I'm his I'm I'm this person's um this person's counsel um, in a courtroom so we're going to look at some of the quote unquote charges that have been brought up against this person in scripture. Um, and I, as this person's defense attorney, I'm, and I'm going to come in, I'm going to be his advocate and I'm going to, and I'm going to see, I'm demonstrate from scripture why I believe the, the accusations against him are, are totally unfair. 
Okay. And um, I don't know. I, I, I'm looking forward to that for some reason. I, I don't know why, but I think it's going to be a good examination. And I hope that you join me um, for that. And then after that, we'll probably get back in, into Acts. Probably. Probably. Um, we'll see how this goes. But anyway, that's it for our time right now. I hope that you've enjoyed our time together. I know that I have, as always. Um, until next time, I'm Steve Gill, and I will see you next time. Bye now. Bye.